So thank you for inviting me to speak about my book, Meeting the Waylo. And I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that I'm actually speaking on Yora country too, and to acknowledge the elders uh, past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Kuringa and Darawal people who are the descendants um, of the two Indigenous men I'll be talking about today, Bungaree and Bundle. My book, Meeting the Waylo, Aboriginal Encounters in the Archipelago, is set along the northwest coastline of Western Australia. The islands, archipelagos, the peninsulas and Aboriginal coastal country, which are now referred to as the Pilbara and Kimberley coasts. The book tells the story of three Indigenous men who voyaged to this coastline aboard Royal Navy expeditions in the early 19th century. The Australian Hydrographic Expedition of Philip Parker King, which began in December 1817 and finished in 1822. He had two Indigenous intermediaries voyaging as part of the expeditionary team. The now iconic Kuringai uh, go-between or cultural broker Bungaree always referred to as Bungari by King, joined the expedition for the first voyage in December 1817. Bundle, a Darawal man, joined the expedition as Bungari's replacement in May 1821. Migo, a Wadjuk Noongar man from the country around Perth, was an intermediary on board HMS Beagle in December 1837, when that expedition under the command of John Clements Wickham travelled from Swan River to the northwest coast in the wake of King's earlier expedition. And given the location of the Royal Australian Historical Society here in Sydney, I thought I would just talk today about uh, Bungaree and Bundle, the two East Coast intermediaries. So the northwest coast is spectacular tidal country. Archipelagos are scattered across the fluctuating land and seascapes. And the land and sea are rich with colour, while the glare and heat from a ferocious sun can be intense and challenging. The solid red rocks that you see here in this picture cover much of this coastal country. Aboriginal people archived their stories onto them over, over 30,000 years, etching, pecking, engraving their culture and events on, and creating a vast outdoor gallery of rock art, the largest in the world. An irresistible canvas, King's Expedition also etched themselves onto these rocks, scratching a sketch of their ship, the Mermaid, onto a red boulder on Enderby Island in February 1818, at a spot they named Rocky Head. And this expeditionary art was discovered by Peter Beth in 2017. Well, the history of exploration has in the past been written as a heroic drama in which the explorer is the principal and sometimes sole protagonist and narrator. My search for the archival traces of Bungaree and Bundle began as part of an ARC Council project led by Shino Kanishi and including Maria Nugent called Exploring the Middle Ground, New Histories of Cross-Cultural Encounters in Maritime and Land-Based Exploration. We understood exploration as a collective effort an experience involving a variety of people from across social strata and cultures coming together, sometimes for a sustained time, at others only briefly, in various kinds of relationships and interactions. Our conversations in this project and research helped me to refine my techniques of searching for the hidden histories of exploration, in particular the histories of intermediaries. During encounters with Aboriginal people on shore, Bungaree and Bundle came into view in King's archive. These expeditionary moments stood out to me because unlike other colonial encounters, the key transactors were all Indigenous. And I think we have become trained to see encounters as oppositional between white and black when actually they could be multi-relational. As Bung Bungaree and Bundle communicated between the crew and the Aboriginal people on shore, they became central figures in encounters. In Meeting the Waylo, I write about how these men are crucial to the success of encounters, influencing or controlling the stage. But in the archive, their power recedes, their experiences so vital 
on the shore or on the quarter deck of the ship have faded or uh, been actively erased. But it has not been a straightforward story of erasure. Sometimes early attempts to include their presence in one archival context did not hold when documents became institutionalized. In making visible these hidden histories, the book also maps those preservation processes and the role and power of archivists, librarians and curators as active agents in both erasure and remembrance. Partly as a result of that process, intermediaries appear unevenly in exploration archives, from occasional rich biographies, such as the case with Bungaree, to little more than shadowy hints. I think I've learnt that searching for shadows sometimes brings rich rewards. So today I thought I would focus on the art archive of King's Expedition and also talk a bit about how I read the archives to make visible the otherwise hidden histories of Bungaree and Bundle. King's archive includes art that was created as an informal record, drawings that were part of the official process of Royal Navy observation, as well as published woodcuts that figure in King's uh, beautiful narrative. The art is found in the form of logbook scratchings, mud maps on loose paper, detailed coastal scenes, sketches of encounters and of Aboriginal weapons, watercolours and portraits. This art occasionally depicts the intermediaries, sometimes explicitly, at other times obliquely. Often, it is the rough shipboard sketches which are the most revealing of the experiences of intermediaries, of their lives on board the ship. Expeditionary art has perhaps done as much work as the words printed in published expedition journals in developing the trope of the heroic white explorer, conqueror of the landscape and of its indigenous inhabitants. But with careful sifting, reading and reckoning with these archives, we can expose something of the lives and stories of Bungaree and Bundle. So I focus today on just a few of these sketches, which hopefully allow you to see some of the moments in action when Bungaree and Bundle were in the archipelagos of the Northwest coast. So Bungaree was a Karingai man born in Broken Bay around 1775. The smallpox epidemic of 1789 was a disaster for Aboriginal groups living in the wider Sydney region. Devastation and hunger may have encouraged Karingai people to move south from Broken Bay towards the British camp. And this is where Bungaree first appears in the colonial records in the 1790s. When Bungaree joined King's expedition in 1817, he had the experience of voyaging with Matthew Flinders on board HMS Investigator. King's midshipman, John Septimus Rowe, wrote about Bungaree in a letter to his father, stating that, a native will prove of essential service, service to us in forwarding our intercourse with any natives we may fall in with on our approaching expedition. Mr. King has obtained the governor's position, permission to take Bungaree, who is very willing to embark again, and we are in high hopes will prove very serviceable, both in the above respect and by the information he appears likely to give with respect to the coasts. Not many Aboriginal intermediaries or guides who worked with explorers had their portraits made and fewer still made their way into published expedition accounts. This is the case with King's Expedition. The published journals do not include any portraits of either Bungaree or Bundle. But beyond these official accounts in the libraries, archives and the private homes are some remarkable sketches of these men. In a large album of drawings and engravings that King collated in his retirement is this sketch that he did of Bungaree. It is my belief that he sketched this portrait in 1819 after the first voyage. You can see the date 1819 on the portrait there, but of course these dates are open for discussion. Portraits of Aboriginal guides by explorers have tended to represent not only the guide, but the explorer's relationship to them. Distrust, disdain, 
or alternatively, fidelity and bravery. While portraits of Bungaree number into their 20s, many of these portraits of him portray him wearing his elaborate wardrobe of European coats and hats, such as the Brigadier General's uniform given to him by Governor Macquarie. If these colourful portraits have drawn historians to Bungaree, I think they also work to maintain a distance, creating perhaps a false sense of proximity between the contemporary viewer and the subject. While King's sketch of Bungaree was not included in his published journal, King did feel the need to visually represent him somewhere in his own recollections on his career. And perhaps that is why the portrait is pasted into his album of drawings and engravings. Here, Bungaree wears an oversized gray coat. As historian Grace Carskins has persuasively shown, for Aboriginal people, European clothing was meaningful and rather than a signifier of cultural dilapidation, which has been read into this portrait here by others, Aboriginal people such as Bungaree wore clothes in distinctively Aboriginal ways. Jacket with the collar turned up and without a shirt, keeping the psychiatrices on his chest, his scarifications visible. King does not include Bungaree's scarifications on his bare chest in this portrait. An important feature in Bungaree's ability to communicate with Aboriginal strangers during the expedition. Yet he also denies Bungaree the colonial identity bestowed on him by Governor Macquarie, drawing the chunky chain of his king plate, but not the plate itself. Perhaps though, Bungaree wore his plate hidden in the way that King depicts here, as it is also depicted similarly by Charles Rodius in another portrait. This portrait here then may suggest a different kind of history of image making in which indigenous peoples are not simply the subject of views, but active in, making, in the making of their own images. Like other intermediaries, Bungaree did not record his own experience of the voyage, but we read of them through the writing of the English explorers. He loved to spear fish in the shallows. He joined the officers on the beach to collect shells. He was an expert in finding fresh water and he regularly worked with the botanist, Alan Cunningham, collecting plant specimens of which he described the indigenous use as well as protecting Cunningham with a rifle while they botanized together on shore. But Bungaree appears most frequently in the archive when he is in the center of the encounters with Aboriginal people and the crew. So a key encounter that I focus on in the book occurred in Dampier's archipelago in February, 1818, where the crew violently bring on board this Yabarara man here who was paddling his watercraft between the islands. To appease this man, Bungaree, removes his prized English outfit, which he had uh, been given as part of his negotiations to join the expedition. And he shows the Aberara captive his scarified chest and shoulders. Bungaree does not leave this man's side while he's on board the ship. And as King records, the man was quite anxious and inquisitive after Bungaree when he wasn't next to him. Bungaree attempted to hold a conversation with this man using his words and his body to communicate. And while the man was focused intently on Bungaree, the explorers closely scrutinized this captive, observing his physique in detail, measuring him and sketching him. Bungaree's presence here was also used by the crew in their racial assessments of this man. For them, Bungaree was a mobile yet stable uh, and uh, tangible Port Jackson Aboriginal type and was therefore the axis on which all Aboriginal groups were compared and juxtaposed while they travelled. As Bungaree had stripped his clothes, standing side by side with the Yabarara captive, the effect, according to the botanist, was a counterpart of mirrored strangers. In this way, Bungaree 
was also being assessed and scrutinized by the crew. King reflected that the captive was a perfect facsimile of the inhabitants of the Eastern coast. So during this on the spot comparison on the quarter deck, a detailed side profile of the captive was made by King. You can see that here. We might imagine King sketchbook and pen in hand, working this up quickly as the encounter was unfolding on board. It may have been uh, an attempt at ethnographic accuracy an instruction from the colonial office prior to disembarking as he included these scarifications on this man's chest, the digging stick in his hair and the detailed depiction of his watercraft, which was also brought on board the ship. I have been known as the kind of historian who puts authenticity in the original tangible archival document believing that digitization offers a poor version of the real thing. However, it wasn't until the digital image of this sketch was sent to me by the art gallery in Western Australia, as I was getting my images ready for publication, that I zoomed in on this sketch and saw a faintly penciled profile of Bungari alongside the Aburara profile subtle visual evidence of King's close scrutiny of these Aboriginal strangers and a remarkable example of just how hidden the histories of intermediaries can be. I hadn't seen this with my naked eye when viewing the sketch at the art gallery, perhaps I need glasses, and while only just perceptible, the likeness here of Bungari is obvious to me. King did not give a title to this sketch, but the art gallery have titled it Man and Artifact. It is unclear what the artifact is that the title refers to. The digging stick worn by the Yabarara man in his hair, a sign of his established status within his group, or the watercraft which floats above, on the page above him. In the same album, which features King's portrait of Bungari, King made an ethnographic montage across two pages in the album, where he cut and pasted Aboriginal weapons, campsites, coastal scenes, and watercraft from his Australian voyages, as well as Indigenous Peruvian watercraft from another explorer's publication, as you can see in the top picture here. It is an abstract montage, the floating log is represented here, and I argue that presented in this abstract way without the sketch of the Yabarara man, the watercraft enters a typology. It becomes an object rather than a utility. Indeed, juxtaposed with Aboriginal weapons from other places, it is out of scale and therefore looks much more like the digging stick in his hair um, or some kind of tool rather than a watercraft. And even though King has identified uh, the log, water log in the album as the floating logs, uh, floating log of the Indians of Dampier's archipelago, an archivist in the Mitchell Library has classified it in the catalogue as an unidentified implement. Bungari's cultural consultations with the crew on this item, so pertinent in the moment of encounter, evaporate from these archive notes. At a distance from the encounter, as archival documents are transferred from a private archive to a state collecting institution, what might, this, what might seem the smallest of details, the muddling or recategorizing of an artifact by an archivist, can have actually long lasting effects. This watercraft, so essential for island life, is represented perhaps as a digging stick, certainly an unidentified implement. For communities in the archipelago today, who are searching for their histories to retrieve uh, and revive dormant cultural practices. These details are vital. And groups in the Northwest are hoping to, um, to start make, remaking these watercraft based on some of the sketches here that King did of their watercraft so long ago. The encounter in Dampier's archipelago was played out over several days 
on shore once the captive had been released from the boat and the Yabarara people engaged with the expedition. There is a dawning realisation by the crew, especially King, that there is immense value in Bungaree's presence amongst the crew when meeting with Aboriginal strangers. He was looked to and depended on by the Yabarara and the crew on board the ship in what was a tense and volatile situation. In the days that followed, when more meetings occurred with the Yabarara, King wrote, Bungaree was made very much of by them. He, however, is of great use to us. On the appearance of a black man being with us has given them a confidence what it could be difficult otherwise to instill. This power and importance of Bungaree, uh, which was readily acknowledged by King and his crew in the moment, was downplayed or deleted in later archival activity. And Bungaree's prominence in the encounters was not as emphasized by King in his published narrative. So I'm now going to turn to Bundle to a slightly later date, 1821. So Bundle had a long history of sea voyaging by the time he joined King's expedition in 1821. Um, not long after, and as a direct result of colonization in 1788, he was orphaned. He was physically striking as a young man. He had lost one eye to a spear wound. Um, and as a young boy, young Darrell boy, he sailed under the care of Captain Hill aboard HMS Supply going to Norfolk Island for a few months in the same year when Philip Parker King was born there. Back in Sydney, Bundle was instrumental in developing the Sydney post-contact pidgin language. And according to the First Fleet Officer, David Collins, Bundle seemed to have gained some smattering of our language, certain words of which he occasionally blended with his own. A natural cross-cultural communicator. This linguistic dexterity filtered through the Aboriginal world rapidly, benefiting Bungaree and other intermediaries. Um, and Bungaree tried to use this new tongue that he had developed at meetings at Twofold Bay and in Dampier's archipelago as well. So Bundle had experience as a sailor. Um, he had labored on board colonial vessels and this made him well placed to join maritime expeditions as an intermediary. I think his skills as a seaman uh, pleased the crew greatly and they described him as extremely useful. And unlike Bungaree, uh, Bundle received wages for his work. So there are no known portraits of Bundle in, like, in the kind that we have of Bungaree. And I could not find any visual representation of him anywhere until fairly recently when I went through the sketches um, by King that were acquired by the Art Gallery of Western Australia in 1920. This scene titled uh, Attacked by Natives, Hanover Bay, visually narrates an encounter that took place in August 1821 between King's expedition and two Aurora men. This encounter occurred along the rocky shoreline and dramatic red cliffs of the Northwest Kimberley coast. It was a violent encounter in which King's surgeon was speared. Initially, the explorers had followed the lead of their intermediary bundle, but they tried to take over and that was when things went quickly wrong. So King has captured this encounter in his unique style of action sequence sketching, painting a narrative flow of how the encounter unfolded moment to moment. And he does this in two other sketches of encounters, one at Luxmore Head and one at King George's Sound. So it is a particular technique that he has developed over the course of um, his voyaging. In this scene, to the right of the scene, two, two Aurora men lean back, their spears shipped, ready to throw at the explorers who are waving their arms irregularly, their bodies out of sync as they attempt to halt the sudden hostility. The sketch captures action and movement. Just left of centre is the only known illustration of Bundle to exist. And I'll just zoom in here. He's identified by King's faint pencil 
inscribing the name bundle above the black figure. When I first saw this sketch, um, I was obviously incredibly excited, but I was struck how bundle is so clearly the only person in control in this encounter. While the explorers um, flail about and they look around in all directions, Bundle has one leg back as he leans forward toward the aurora, his body strong, his stance assured, confident in what he is doing. The details of this encounter are recorded in the journals of King and the botanist Alan Cunningham and, and quite um, openly in the letters of midshipman John Septimus Rowe. All accounts are slightly different and offer um, unique aspects of the story that, um, that when read together unpack quite a different experience in my opinion. The explorer's ship anchored in Hanover Bay on the 7th of August 1821. A jolly boat you can see here on the left of the scene rowed towards the rocky shoreline early in the morning where two Warora people were standing and calling out to them. Like Bungaree before him, Bundle removed his clothes and stood in the bow of the boat making signs to the Warora as they approached the shore. The two men looked down towards the boat from the flat delta above the shoreline and repeated the signs of peace that Bundle had made to them. At first, only King and Bundle climbed up the big red rocks towards the Warora, while the surgeon and other officers stayed close to the boat. King wrote that by the time Bundle and King joined the Warora on the delta, their spears were shipped ready to throw. And so he and Bundle offered gifts to the men. In exchange, Bundle received a belt made of possum fur and King a club. Bundle observed the style of the man who gave him the belt and tied it around his head, copying um, what he had done. Half an hour passed with Bundle mediating when the surgeon, Dr. Montgomery, and another officer decided to climb up the rocks to join in this encounter. Montgomery, who had his pistol with him, threw some fish towards the men and things began to quickly unravel. Either the swelling of numbers on the, of strangers of, on their country or the act of throwing fish or Montgomery's pistol unsettled the Aurora. King tried to take control, taking back a clasp knife that had been gifted to the Aurora earlier and attempting to awe them by showing them how to open and close it. However, as King wrote in his journal, this tactic, instead of pacifying, only served to increase the Aurora men's anger. King threw the knife back at their feet and then the two Aurora ret men retired a few paces. As the crew turned their backs on the Aurora to retreat to the boat, the Aurora both threw their spears, one hitting a rock and breaking in half, another spearing the surgeon Montgomery in the back. Montgomery reacted by firing off a shot from his pistol, another reason why the meeting might have turned sour, while the other officers picked up rocks to throw at their attackers. Bundle picked up the broken spear and ran after the men who had fled. So this pen and gray wash sketch that we can see here is a tableau of friction. It narrates the timeline of this encounter from opening friendly gestures by Bundle through moments of slipperiness and uncertainty by the crew. To the left of the scene, the midshipman, hat in hand, waves for help, while the rescue team who have been on board the ship, looking through their eyeglasses, have rowed ashore and are clambering up the rocks, ready to rescue the party and take revenge. I spent a long time studying this sketch in the art gallery in Western Australia, thinking about this scene and King's motivation to represent the encounter in this way. I wondered if this sketch was developed as a memory jogger, maybe a narrative timeline to help King record the order of events. And I wondered why it hadn't been included as a woodcut in his published narrative, especially since the weapons that the crew stole in revenge had been worked up into a woodcut by Francis Chantry and published in his narrative. You can see that sketch here. Then just a few weeks ago, working with Brian Abbott, a descendant of Philip Parker King, Brian very generously showed me another sketch made of this scene by King 
stored in an album owned by one of King's relatives and now housed in the Mitchell Library. Histories never end. It is hard to know which sketch was done first, but this is a rougher version of the art gallery sketch with even more movement and detail and the addition of an extended timeline. Here, one of the Warora men has his spear shipped primed to throw it. Directly next to him to the left, a spear possibly pierces Montgomery, while the other Warora man is already in the act of running away into the bushes after his spear has been thrown. Bundle is not in his strong stance of mediation, but rather is bending down, probably to pick up the spear after it had been thrown. This scene is more chaotic. The explorers are moving very quickly. Their arms are really waving about in many directions. And the officer who was waving his hat, calling out for help to the left of the scene, um, has, is not holding his hat, but has in his hand what appears to be a rifle instead. Well, this might feel like an exercise in spot the difference, but attending to King's revisions here of this dynamic encounter enables us to understand the ways in which an encounter story takes shape over time, from chaos and action, where we see the surgeon perhaps in the act of being speared and the explorers in a state of pure panic, to a scene of more clarity and control, where in fact, Bundle is holding court. Sketching themselves into the scene, the explorers are presented as part of a witness statement, lending credence to their account or their representation as a factual one. They are present in many of the, the, the sketches of this expedition. In my book, I lament the fact that Bundle's name was removed when this watercolour was archived in the art gallery. King had pencilled Bundle's name so carefully onto the sketch, a common process in his archival practice to document details of events on much of his artwork. Unlike the Mitchell Library where a catalogue search for Bungaree brings up literally hundreds of items, the name Bundle, however, is absent from the Agua, the art gallery collection notes and database. Therefore, a search for the name Bundle does not show up in the art gallery collection. This is how histories of these men remain invisible. I wonder if the Mitchell Library could be persuaded to include Bundle's name in their listing of the album, which includes this sketch here of Hanover Bay. There's a detailed um, a sketch of the scene there. Revenge was violent against the Warora people following the spearing of Montgomery. The crew stole large amounts of their material culture, which they found on the beach in a catamaran, some of which was sent to London. As King recorded in the Bathurst logbook in 1821, 35 spears, six stone spearheads, five or six stone hatchets, baskets, shells, twine, and a knife made from an iron hoop were plundered from the catamaran that they found on shore. Rowe, the midshipman, recorded that the stone spearheads were later shared among the officers. And here, Rowe sketches his own booty in a letter to his father. One of these spearheads that the crew obtained was later drawn by the sculptor Francis Chantry and depicted in this woodcut uh, alongside the other weapons of the Warora that were stolen. And you can see the dominance of that stone spearhead um, way out of scale. Um, and you can see that it's, in, it's been sketched in its full size by the artist. Well, since my book has been published, Dr. Gay Sculthorpe, curator of Oceania at the British Museum, has amended the British Museum online catalogue to include Bundle's name, in relation to Hanover Bay objects that the museum owns. You can see here on the left, his name is included um, with the name of King, the ship, the Bathurst, the, the, the surgeon who got speared, Dr. Montgomery, and also with Newbury Rectory, which was where um, John, John Septimus Rowe's family established a museum in their own home, um, mostly uh, filled with items that Rowe and others had collected during these voyages. 
So having Bundle's biographical details included here on this catalogue, and which means that his name is now searchable, and if you click on his name, you'll it comes up with a, a brief biography of him. This really is how the histories of these men become and remain visible in the archive. Thank you. I'll leave it there.